Welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, Jack, yes. you're at it again. Were you on the streets today? I was on the streets today, yeah. What do you hope that today will do that maybe it didn't do last, uh, last April? I think last April was the beginning of something that is growing exponentially and will probably carry on for my entire lifetime. Um, we're not seeing enough action by our governments and we're going to keep coming out into the streets until our governments react accordingly. We are in the midst of a climate crisis and we're not seeing that reflected by governments or in policy. And so we're just going to keep coming out into the streets until our demands are met. So let me ask you both then. I mean, I did say that actually the tide does seem to be turning people seem to be taking this much more seriously, not just in the streets, but, you know, in Congress, in the European Parliament, in, in Parliament here. Do you think, uh, Farhana, who have worked so long on these accords, that things are changing? Yes, they are. And I think that's the reason why we want people to keep continuing to come out on the streets. It is working. Last, uh, since, uh, since April, we had the UK Parliament pass a motion declaring a climate emergency. We have the net zero target uh, being passed in legislation, but not enough is being done to actually implement those declarations, as it were, of intent. And so we need people to come out and say month after month what needs to happen because there's not enough progress being made to fulfill even the things that were put in place uh, back in April. So just so that we have a framework, what exactly are you asking governments to do right now? I mean, what, what, what are you on the streets for right now today? Extinction Rebellion have three central demands. The first is to act now, so that's for governments to acknowledge the crisis we're in and to act on it. Which they do, though. Uh, they are acting, but, but they're not taking the right measures, the measures they need to be. They're not acting enough. Right, we're not on, on, on track to with the Paris Agreement. Experts tell us there's a, a thing called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which you're aware of it. The world's leading experts gathered to, together in the IPCC. They say we've got just 12 years to limit temperature rise to no more than 1.5 degrees if we want a habitable future on this planet. Uh, currently, the temperature's at 1.1 degrees, so that's just 0 0.4 degrees more. Currently, we're not on track for that at all. We're on track for two or three degre degrees of warming. And, and what that means, if we hit two or three degrees warming, it means no one my age has a future. They don't have a habitable future on this planet. And if you're a young person, as we've seen with Greta Thunberg, I think that gives you a right to be angry and to, and to demand a habitable future. I think any person my age would agree with that. That's, that's a right, a, a human right that we have. So, yes. Yeah, and I think very specifically here in the UK, governments need to enhance what their actions and policies right now. They are so far behind their legally binding carbon budgets. The UK is not meeting its own legally you know, mandated budget for the next five years and the five years after that. So it's no good having a, a nice goal for 2050 if you're failing with the five-year progress points uh, put in place in our domestic legislation and also demanded by Paris. So that's what the protests all over the world are about. You're aware that the UN Secretary General asked countries um, and heads of state to come forward with their next Paris commitments, which are due next year. It's already five years. Paris is already five yeah. years old. And not, not many of the big countries have come forward with commitments. They're all backsliding, actually, which is not the intent of Paris. Tell me something, because I find this very interesting, and weirdly, or maybe not weirdly, but a lot of the media attention, a lot of the interviews, even today, around what you're doing in the streets, actually focus on the security and focus on whether you should actually be out, be out there doing things that get you arrested. I mean, I read out what Extinction Rebellion says. Um, you know, it's about rebelling, and some have said it's about disruption. That's the whole point. Mm. Arrests are the point. They're not just a byproduct. So both of you, in uh, maybe at the same rebellion movement, have actually got yourselves arrested. Mm. You glued yourself outside Shell Hell headquarters. You glued yourself, or you did something, right? I did, yeah, I glued myself yeah, at the International Petroleum Conference. Yeah. Just can you tell me, how do yeah. you get the glue off? How do they... They worked very hard with a solvent and sort of, a, you know, pushed the police. that through and very gently removed that. So it is... This the, is the police? The police, yeah. and they were, you know, uh, took, took great care to, to not injure people. So I think in this country, you know, we are fortunate that we have policing, which is enables protests to take place. There was, in fact, in my case, I'm waiting to hear what charges will, will be made. But the reason I broke the law is because companies like Shell have postured and greenwashed and have are uh, still continuing to pursue fossil fuel investments. Um, and overall, the top five companies, uh, fossil fuel companies, 
have spent $1 billion since Paris, essentially on lobbying and marketing, and giving the impression that they're doing enough, and they're not. Mm -hmm. Their business model is still weighted towards uh, fossil fuel production. That's 97% of their billions and billions of dollars are going towards expanding fossil fuel production. So for me as a lawyer, I felt very happy to go away in handcuffs um, and show that criminal damage is still going on and in, by and large in a very unaccountable way. So for me, that was the, 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 the litmus test of how credible you know, our effort is. You're a lawyer. You're also a co-drafter, preparer of international treaties. You have your status, your stature, and your life. You are a young man who's got yourself arrested, mm -hmm. whose life is in, in play mm -hmm. right now. You have been to court. Mm -hmm. You're waiting for the verdict. Is that right? I'm waiting for the verdict. I'll be on court on Wednesday to receive the verdict. But even the charges that have been placed against me have significantly impacted my life. I've lost jobs as a result of it. So um, it's not glamorous getting arrested. It's the first time I've ever been arrested. I didn't set out to be arrested. It's not something I ever thought I, I, I would do in my life. And it's affected my life seriously. But I feel as a young person that I, I, we are out of options. You know, we have known about this issue for 30 years. My mum was a climate activist when I was 14. I've watched people take to the streets over and over again, write letters, write to their MPs. We are out of options. It's a crisis. And I felt this was the only thing I could do. And it's worth saying as well, I, um, my hand came off the door because I didn't put enough glue on. And I didn't do that because I was terrified. I was really scared. This is my first time ever sort of stepping across the boundaries of the law. And I think it's important to make that point that these are really ordinary people sacrificing their liberties in extraordinary times. These aren't professional activists or people who enjoy causing disturbances. We may be causing disturbances right now. And, and if that's the case, we're sorry. But that is to prevent far greater disturbances in the future, of which are just, millions of deaths. It there, really is touching watching, that, actually, Jack, the fact that you were terrified. Yeah. yeah, and I was there, actually, when he was arrested. I was outside, and uh, let me tell you, Jack, that your actions inspired me, oh. actually. Um, and I feel it's my generation. It's not for our young people to compromise their future. We've already compromised their future. It's for us to stand up. And there are many, many, many older activists who, for that reason, have come forward. I'm also a mother. I have children who are Jack's age, down to 12. They've been part of the student strikes. They've been out rebelling in their own ways. And I really, really feel that, as a parent, that's one of the reasons why I'm there. I'm also there as a lawyer. I can understand and navigate the legal system. So I feel I would rather take that risk on. I would rather they didn't have to do that. Greta and and the yet, youth are making very clear that and yet it's them who are making yes. people stand up and or sit up and take notice. And I think what's really interesting, what were you what were you charged with? I was charged in, initially with uh, criminal damage and aggravated trespass. The criminal damage was thrown out on the first day of court. It was essentially fabricated by the hotel. And the trespass is for uh, being asked to leave land and, and, and not acting on, on that. However, I was never asked to leave the land. I was never given a warning. I was just simply arrested. And that's what's being argued in court. And I suppose I can't go into too much details, but we'll find out on Wednesday whether. What, what's the worst that could happen to you? I suppose the worst will be a criminal record, uh, perhaps a conditional discharge, which will be a temporary criminal record. It could be a fine. It could be community service. And you, who have been, as you say, a lawyer and, and active in, in all of these, uh, I've been told that this is, there has never been so many activists who've been arrested and then sent to, to the court system. There are many occasions when activists of all sorts of different protests have been arrested, but never have so many actually been processed through the courts. Why do you think that's happening? Yeah, courtrooms have been set aside specifically. There's absolutely no reason to spend taxpayers' money, you know, essentially deterring and you know, coming down hard line for activism, which the politi politicians say are, it has absolutely been justified, you know. Um, so I, I feel like it's a vindictive and, and rather uh, heavy-handed approach, and that's what we're seeing also today. And it won't deter people. It won't deter me. I hear people like Jack, I see my own children, I see the children in the world asking adults to step up and to act with more braveness and courage. And I feel our legal systems must be more measured and must be more gracious in terms of allowing lawful protest on an issue which affects everyone. So then let me let me read you or play you actually one of these quotes. Um, Richard Walton, who probably you're aware of, he's the former head of the Met's Counter-Terrorism Command, and he's called for different protest laws to be in place, saying the current laws are too weak. Um, and and this, is, this is what he said about the right of people to, to protest. Let's just play what he said to the radio today. 
there is, of course, a right to, um, for people to protest. But there are other rights, too, and people have a right to, to go about their business in London today without being obstructed, without people not being able to reach hospitals. Um, you know, there is an element of harm that people are underestimating with this, uh, this obstruction, if you like, of, of normal living. Um, an element of harm, he says, that, mm. that, that you're not taking into account. Mm. Do you feel a huge amount of pressure from the police? Is this different kind of policing than in other kinds of protests, mm. do you think? Well, they've been completely peaceful on all occasions, and uh, I'm sure that that will continue. And I think what people have to look at is not just the disruption to everyday life or everyday uh, living in London or other capital cities. They have to look at devastation that is going on in many parts of the world right now, right here. You report the wildfires, you report the devastation of the Bahamas, you report the devastation of many of the small islands, and people need to, to, to really take that to heart now. It's beyond the point at which it's just a small disruption here and there. It is changing the life systems on Earth, and most of the frontline communities in many parts of the world are beyond their coping capacities. I saw that you were you know, doing a piece on Syria earlier. Well, we all know that actually one of the underlying factors yep. behind the Syrian conflict is the water drought situation yep. that has made large parts of the country unlivable and which led to six million people being internally displaced. So these kinds of conflicts, this kind of devastation is what is the background to the disruption that is being uh, taken, that is taking place here today. And I have to say that the, the protests have been designed so that there is no harm done, that, you know, ambulances can pass, there is complete safety assured as much as possible. And to be honest, there are lots of times when bridges are shut down and the tube doesn't work or that there's a strike at the airport and, you know, people can't go on holiday and so forth. So I think people have yeah. to take this in there. Well, you know, and let me read what Caroline Lucas of the Green Party, who's, I mean, obviously, it's the Green Party, um, and she's obviously defending all of you who are facing court and saying that people who are prepared to take part in nonviolent direct action were showing more climate leadership than government ministers. She said, in the future, it won't be those peacefully blockading bridges or blocking roads that history judges bad it will be those who judge their eyes and block their ears, or rather who shut their eyes and block their ears. The failure to avert the climate catastrophe is the greatest moral failure of our time. Do you think the message is getting through, Jack? You're a protester, you're young, you've been doing this, as you said, with your mum since you were 14 years old. The, the message does seem to be getting through, and interestingly, I read also about a lot of, like, retirees and mm. grandparents and people who are going with their kids to these demonstrations or figuring out how to go, get into this activism so that they can, as some of them say, look their kids and their grandkids in the eye and say that I did something. In New York, the Board of Education there on Climate Protest Day allowed one and a half million children mm. to leave school to protest on that day. Mm. Does that give you encouragement? Yeah, the message is getting through, and in that sense, I do feel hopeful. You have to remember that Extinction Rebellion is just 11 months old, right? So 11 months ago today, I stood outside um, Downing Street and, and declared a uh, rebellion against the government. And I never could have imagined it would have grown to where it was, to where it is today. You know, it started with 100 people outside the House of Parliament, then a few hundred blocked five bridges. Then we had the rebellion in April, where I last spoke to you. And now we have today, which is an international rebellion. You know, what we have to remember is there are people all around the world, in New Zealand, Amsterdam, Spain, Paris, taking civ non-violent civil resistance against their governments to demand action. This is not just in the UK. This is global, and it's growing. Is it happening fast enough? No, and that's why we're out in the streets. Does it give me hope? Yes, and I know that I will commit the rest of my life to this issue. And, you, you, you know, there is such a, a history of really very important non-violent resistance. I mean, you can mm. go back to Gandhi, mm. go all the way to the anti-nuke protests mm. and things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you feel like you're stepping up. I, I, I feel we stand on the shoulders of giants. And if you look back at a lot of those social movements, at the time, they were incredibly controversial. People were hated. They caused riots in the streets. But we look back at those people and we consider them to be legends. And I, you know, I hope that that's what happens with Extinction Rebellion. It is causing people a discomfort and, and, you know, getting in the way on a daily basis today. But we'll look back and we'll say, thank God, that Extinction Rebellion sounded the alarm and we acted when we could, at least... I'll be able to say that to my children, if indeed I do have kids, because many people my age are also starting to realise they may never be able to bring children into the world, and that is a really devastating thought. And actually, it's a really important thought to end on, because it just puts into perspective, 
exactly how existential this is and what everybody's doing, or your generation is doing, with the help of people like yourself, the experts. Well, I hope everyone will join I us. I think they are. Group, I mean, I think a lot uh, of people... This kind of protest works. A lot yeah. of people are okay. getting the message now, and, and people are, are, are not just walking the walk, but they're voting as well, and whether it's in Europe, or in the United States, or wherever it is. The last thing to say is, if you do come down, it is a joyous occasion. It's a celebration of life, and today we were both at our friend's wedding on Westminster Bridge, mm -hmm. and it's an absolute celebration of life. It isn't violent, it isn't aggressive. Yeah. It is a celebration of life, and they should come. Thank you. Jack Harris? Farhani Yamin, thank you both indeed for coming in.